Is he staying? Is he going? Is he staying? Is he going? I am well aware that this isn't a flower, but it is winter in Wisconsin. This is what you get. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Lombardi Time Brews. I am your host, John Delray. Yeah, uh, we are in full-blown off-season mode now, right? I mean, Matt LaFleur gave his press conference late on Monday uh, to kind of wrap things up. Brian Gutekunst goes on Friday morning, I do believe. Um, and players are getting the heck out of town. <laughs> we know from Pat McAfee that Aaron Rodgers has been meeting with the Packers all day yesterday and then supposedly all day today being Wednesday. Um, as obviously I don't believe any choices, any decisions are being made. Um, but they're conversing about what are Brian Gutekunst's priorities moving forward. How does Aaron fit into that? What's going on with the coaching staff? All the things that Aaron wants the information on about what the team is intending to do and his opportunity to offer opinions too before he departs back to California or Peru or Greece or wherever that man is going for this portion of the offseason. So, you know, here we are, dead middle now of the offseason, and it's going to be this way for a long time time draft content is still a ways out uh, obviously mini camps is forever from now so it is time to speculate a little about the existing roster who's coming back coaching staff changes is obviously a huge topic right now and so we're going to dive into that first you know, Matt LaFleur in his press conference yesterday, he continued to describe how, like, they failed in every single facet. The team overall was a failure this year, etc. All those lovely coach speak terms to say, yep, yeah, I didn't do good enough, nor did anyone who works here, nor did the players, not anybody, right? But the thing that he also said was that he does not anticipate any changes to the coaching staff. And here's a couple things, right? Historically, he has said things like, well, everyone is under review at this time. We're going to go through. We're going to take our time. I need the chance to talk to my staff. He has said things like that before. You know, and I've seen some people say, well, this whole he threw in anticipate. So, yeah, it's all just general coach speak. No, I think him saying, we're going to take our time. I'm going to talk to the staff. Let's just see where everybody's at. I think that's much more buying time or a prelude to firing. Uh, this feels like him saying, I'm going to keep the staff intact, barring something unforeseen. Well, what could be unforeseen? How about uh, Robert Saleh, if he were to get fired by the Jets? Might he be something unforeseen that Matt LaFleur would want to bring in? Or how about, as was widely reported this morning and then shot down and then re-reported and no one knows what's going on there, how about his little brother, LaFleur from the Jets, who's been their offensive coordinator? Again, hmm. Or bringing in Nathaniel Hackett again or out and bringing him back. So there's lots of possibilities. But the very first thing that I want to dive into more in depth here is obviously by him keeping the entire coaching staff. What does that mean for our defense? It means defensive coordinator Joe Barry is back. At least for now. Or that's the plan. And boy, the rage was real out of what I saw from Packer fans. But here's the thing. My personal reaction to that news? Eh. Kind of saw it coming. I've been talking about it for weeks, right? That Matt LaFleur never seemed to show the outward angst to Joe Barry that he's shown to other coordinators that he's gotten rid of. And we know that the defense, in the beginning part of the year, when the offense was completely non-functional, 
the defense really got screwed a lot. The Packers were the exact opposite of complementary football in the beginning of the year. And then all of a sudden, over the last stretch here, the defense just kind of figured itself out. So I don't... It's difficult for me to have an opinion on Joe Barry because I don't completely understand what happened to the defense. Like, if it were just bad, fine, get rid of Joe Barry. But it wasn't. It was fine, and then it was awful, and then it was good. And then it ended the season really good. And I've been going off all year about how baffling it is that Joe Barry, who came in last year and said, we're gonna tackle now, and all of a sudden the Packers tackled extremely well last year, and then this year they forgot? Or Joe Barry just stopped teaching it? Because we know that one of the things that the defense actively got worse at this year was tackling. We also know that one of the things that Joe Barry uh, implemented last year was less of this whole cornerbacks playing eight yards off nonsense on third and three. He did less of it last year. And then it increased in frequency this year. Why? Like, why, why are we going backwards in time to what Patton called? And yet, in spite of that, over the last stretch of season, by a lot of metrics, they were elite. How? <laughs> like, this is the thing, right? And I'm not sure anyone completely understands. And so for that, Joe Barry, right now, it looks like he's going to be getting at least another year. I will say, though, that all of the calls of, well, Matt LaFleur is just keeping his friends. I mean, I know LaFleur and Barry have been on similar staffs, but when he was hired on, I don't remember the narrative being that this is LaFleur's best friend or like they're really good friends. So I think that's taking it too far. I think LaFleur, like just to be, you know, completely speculative here, He's actively just saying, Barry put them in places to succeed more often than not. We know even early in the season when there were some defensive struggles, he came right out and said it, that the players have to make the plays that they are put in position to make. And you can see the writing on the wall there that he was not blaming Joe Barry for the defensive deficiencies. I guess my overall qualm here with the defense is almost all of your defensive personnel took a large step back this year compared to last year. Exceptions being maybe Rashawn Gary, maybe Kenny Clark, but Adrian Amos, certainly. Jerry Alexander, you can argue, he took a step back. Eric Stokes, certainly. Devondre Campbell, absolutely. Even some of the defensive linemen. And when you have that widespread of a talent or a, a performance regression, who do you look at? Is it a question of leadership for the coach that he's not able to keep them accountable? Does that fall on the position coaches? If it's this widespread, you'd be inclined to believe not, right? So overall, am I angry about the move to keep Joe Barry? No. Am I thrilled? No. More confused. <laughs> and I, I will say, on the whole, on the entirety, the Green Bay Packers need on their coaching staff. And I know this sounds totally cliche or whatever, because, like, football man. But, like, they need a Dan Campbell, a Kevin Green, even what Mike Smith was. They need someone loud. Someone to hold every single player accountable while also infusing energy. Now, Rich Bisaccia is that for special teams, and we saw the effect that it took, but I do believe strongly that the defense needs someone like that. And in years past, by all accounts, it's been Mike Smith. The defense needs its enforcer. By the way, the offense does too, but I think it's more vital on defense. 
Now let's take a look at the offensive possibilities, right? Nathaniel Hackett, all of a sudden gone from Denver, one of two first-year head coaches ever to be let go. He joins the esteemed Urban Meyer in that category. Might he come back to Green Bay? I think he very well might. And I think where you have the opportunity to bring him back is in the mold of like a senior offensive assistant, something to that effect. Because keep in mind, the Green Bay Packers do have an offensive coordinator in Adam Stenovich. And I don't think when Lafleur goes to Stenovich and says, hey, we're bringing Hackett back, we're just going to demote you right back down. I don't think that's going to fly. So you've got three guys, I think, on offense that Lafleur would love to bring in in some capacity who either have worked for him already or Lafleur has tried to get. Nathaniel Hackett is one. And I think he could be like a senior offensive consultant, something like that. Red zone coordinator. Bring back the gold zone because we suck in the red zone. Two, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they would love to bring back Outen, their former, I think he was the tight ends coach a few years ago, before he left to go join Hackett as Hackett's offensive coordinator. But again, you've already filled the void that these guys have left behind. So you need to find a role for Outen. Or release someone, fire someone to create a role. In which case, what does that do to your staff morale? And then lastly, I think Lafleur would love to bring in his brother. Offensive coordinator of the Jets. We know that Lafleur, when he very first got the Packers job, he attempted to hire his brother to come to Green Bay and San Francisco blocked the move. So there's interest for the two of them to work together. And I'm actually perhaps most intrigued by this one. I think Hackett being back would be great for the red zone. But I think bringing Lafleur's brother in as well would help get the Packers a little bit more to the Shanahan offense. Where Matt Lafleur's younger brother has seemingly been more of a disciple of than Matt himself, who's kind of perversed it with the McVay tree. So... Here you have little Lafleur, a little bit more Shanahan, and we saw in the Jets versus Packers game that he was not afraid to dial up some stuff for the Jets offense. It'd be great to see that new energy infusion, new ideas into an offense that by most accounts this year looked stagnant and dead. So how do you bring him in? Well, right now in the offense, you've got your offensive coordinator, Adam Stenovich, and then you do have Jason Vrabel, who's the wide receivers coach, as well as passing game coordinator. The Packers do not have a run game coordinator. So maybe you bring it in there. I know, I'm pushing the envelope here, right? Common logic says you're going to have to get rid of someone to bring someone in, but that's not necessarily true if Matt LaFleur wants to do it enough and bring in another body. Now, we know the Packers already have one of the largest coaching staffs in the NFL. LaFleur is not afraid to take a democratic and groupthink approach. So it's possible. We'll see what develops. Now, moving on. The other topic of the day, I, I saw Andy Herman actually put this out on Twitter, and I thought it was a very, very interesting thought exercise. And it's looking at the current 53-man roster and saying, who, who from this list is unequivocally guaranteed to be back in 2023? Yes, guaranteed. Now, these are not guys that are not under contract right now because, of course, they're not guaranteed back. So these are guys that are under contract right now that I am 100% confident in saying they will be back for the Green Bay Packers in 2023. A couple of them you're going to raise your eyebrows at. And I understand very much, but this is my feeling on I would be shocked if they're not back. So, number one, and I'm going to move it by position, so let's start off at the running back position. A.J. Dillon. Yeah, I think Dillon's back. Of course, he still has time left on his contract. Aaron Jones is a much larger question. I think the Packers are going to try to bring him back, but with that cap number being about $20 million next year, Aaron Jones is much tougher to bring in. A.J. Dillon being the 1B of the Packers running back situation, I think is secure. He'll be back. Wide receivers, I think you've got two here that are guaranteed locks to be on next year's 53. Of course, that's Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson. Others are either free agents themselves, like Lazard and Cobb, or they're just far enough down the roster that it's a question as to whether they would make the 53 on another goal round, and that would be someone like Samari Toure or Bo Melton. 
So wide receivers, Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, they're back. Tight ends, I think you only have one, and that would be Josiah DeGuara. He's still under contract for next year. Tunyon is not. Mercedes Lewis is not. Tyler Davis, I didn't even bother looking up his contract situation, to be completely frank. I do believe he's a free agent too, but he barely made the roster this year. We would have to see for next year. Then the offensive line, and I think that this is the one that may raise the most eyebrows. To me, David Bakhtiari's back. I mean, when he came back and played and his knee was stabilized, he was still one of the best left tackles in football, right? There were a few weeks where he even got the Packers' highest graded run blocking grade. Which is not what... I mean, David Bakhtiari's always been good at it, but not better than Elton Jenkins good at run blocking. He played way too well to not be brought back. And if they let him go, what, they're going to save something like $6 million on the cap? So the question in my head is if this is the way that sometimes I think about the cap savings questions, okay? If David Bakhtiari were a free agent right now, would you pay $6 million to have David Bakhtiari as your starting left tackle? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's a question for like anyone across the NFL. $6 million in the grand scheme of things is nothing in an NFL cap. So if the question is, cutting him is going to save you that... Keeping him is basically the rough equivalent of just signing him for that much, right? And I think I think you'd be foolish not to. So, I don't know. I know that there's some different numbers that have been reported by different people and stuff. The one that I've seen most prevalently is a savings of about $6 million if they let him go right now. To me, it makes no freaking sense. Um, David Bakhtiari will be back. Elton Jenkins off of his brand new contract extension. Of course he's back. Josh Myers will be back. I don't know as if he'll be starting next year. I think they may bring in some competition, but he'll be back. John Ronnie Jr. still under contract. will be back. Zach Tom, of course, is going to be back. One of the easier calls on the entire roster. And then I'm going to throw in one, two as well. The third round pick of this last year, that would be Sean Ryan. Now, Sean Ryan had about as terrible of a rookie year as you can have. He was a healthy scratch a lot, never got to play, got suspended at the end of the year, never was even close to sniffing playing time. They played Jake Hansen over him. So I think there's a lot of questions there, but Sean Ryan, to me, unequivocally is back just because I can't see them moving on from a third round pick in only year two. Moving over to the defensive side of the ball, of course Kenny Clark is back, TJ Slayton is back, and of course Devontae Wyatt, first round defensive lineman, is back as well. And the edge, you get a few more question marks. Rashawn Gary, of course he's back. He's one of the best players on the team. Kingsley Anagbare, who had a heck of a rookie year, he'll be back at a big part of the rotation next year. I do not have Preston Smith on this list. I would like Preston Smith back. I think they're going to try to bring him back. I think it would be foolish not to. But there are lots of avenues of which Preston Smith may not be on the team, most of them financial. So I can't say with 100% conviction that Preston Smith will be back. Moving on from that at inside linebacker two, Devondre Campbell and Quay Walker, both fairly easy choices, and at cornerback Jair Alexander, Roswell Douglas, and Eric Stokes. I do not have any of the safeties on this list. Adrian Amos is a free agent. There's possibility they bring him back, especially given his void year cap considerations, but I can't guarantee that at all. Darnell Savage, yes, I know he's locked into that fifth year option number, but the Packers have to decide. If they can get another team to bite on his on his projections, on his potential, then they may move him to get out of that $7.9 million cap number. It's possible. Rudy Ford is a free agent. So, you know, that's a room full of question marks at this point. One other offensive lineman that I didn't talk about would be Yash. Yes, Yash is, by all intents and purposes, a restricted free agent. The Packers are probably going to look to be tendering him, probably first, second round tender. And the only reason why I didn't have him as an absolute lock is because I could envision a world where a team with a historically bad offensive line that just can't get it right throws a bunch of money at Yash and pays the second round tender price. I could at least see it. Is it likely? Probably not. But is it possible? Yes. And it would put the Packers in a position of either having to match when you're already going to keep David Bakhtiari and Zach Tom, not to mention the fact that you've got Rashid Walker and Caleb Jones, 
they would have to match a whole bunch of money for Yash. And I just, I can see too many scenarios where it's at least possible that Yash doesn't return. Two other players that I wanted to highlight that are not on this list. I didn't put them on the 53 lock list, but I think there's no way the Packers allow them to leave. Number one, Keyshawn Nixon. Yeah, I just can't see it. He meant too much to the team. Yes, he's a free agent this year. Yes, he's going to be getting a big pay raise, similar to Razul Douglas last year. I don't know as if he's going to touch Razul money, but he's getting a big raise, right? We can say that unequivocally without any doubt. I just think he was too much of a smart plug. He's too well-respected on the team already. He fills too many functions. He's a good enough nickel corner while being the heir apparent to Desmond Howard. I think the Packers figure out a way to retain him. And then the second one that I want to mention and highlight is Jordan Love. Yes, if Aaron Rodgers returns, Jordan Love is going to, by all accounts, be quite angsty about having to sit for a fourth year. I also think that if Jordan Love goes to the Packers and said, I want to trade, the Packers are going to look at him and be, Aaron Rodgers is turning 40 next year. Yeah, he made it through this year with a broken thumb. We can't guarantee that he's going to do that again. Also, how many years do you think he's got left? You are a valuable asset to us. You are still the heir apparent in Green Bay. You're staying. Sorry. So, are there situations that Jordan Love could be traded? Sure. Sure. That's why I didn't put him on this list, because those situations are at least possible. But I think Jordan Love is sticking around no matter what. So there you have it. That is a good 20-person foundation towards the 53-man roster of your 2023 Green Bay Packers. Of course, there's lots of questions, lots of unknowns, lots of developments, and we'll see. We'll see next September just how right this list is. But this is the list that I feel really good about is going to be on the 53-man roster next year. Thanks so much for joining me on Lombardi Time Brews. I will be back on Friday. I'm going to be going over the defensive position MVPs on Friday, as well as covering Brian Gutekunst's press conference that is occurring on Friday as well. Hope you had a great day today. Hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, Go Pack Go!